Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon and, and welcome to the meeting. Uh, my name is Dan Evans. Uh, I'm a senior research associate at Lancaster University and I am the former National Early Career Officer for the Society, the British Society of Soil Science. Uh, following our successful event in July, today is the second Zoom into Soil webinar. And before I welcome our two speakers, I'd like to invite our incoming president, Bruce Lascelles, uh, who will provide a brief introduction to the hosts of today's meeting, the British Society of Soil Science. Over to you, Bruce. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone as well. And thank you for attending this. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the British Society of Soil Science is an established international membership organisation and a charity committed to the study of soils in its uh, widest aspects. And as a society, we bring together those working with academia, practitioners, implementing soil science industry, and those who work with or have a, a keen interest in soils. Um, due to the situation we find ourselves in, uh, this year, our annual conference, which is entitled Soil in Action, is going to take place virtually on Friday the 4th of December. And that conference is going to focus on the links between academic research and industry. And we'll have uh, speakers from forensic science and from the construction sector to complement the academic expertise uh, which is being presented. Um, and that conference is available free of charge for members of the society. So if you want to find out more about membership, uh, which starts from just £31 per annum, please do highlight that in your response to the event uh, survey uh, and someone will get in touch with you with further information. Um, so thank you for attending again. Um, I hope you enjoy the session. I'll, I'll hand back to Dan. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you for that. And it's uh, exciting uh, news about that conference. Well, before we begin, some basic housekeeping then. Uh, as there are so many of you at the moment, I note 119 currently on, uh, all of your microphones have been muted. Um, we'll be uh, taking questions at the end of the uh, presentations this, after uh, this afternoon. And I'm going to ask uh, these questions on your behalf. So if you could submit those questions uh, using the, the software that you're on currently, uh, by 12.50, that's 10 to one, uh, that will allow us to get through as many as possible. So that's uh, 10 to one for, uh, for the questions to both our, our panelists this afternoon. Uh, there is a raise your hand button, but we won't be using this unless of course the speaker specifically asks to see a show of hands. Well, today's presentation has also been awarded uh, BASIS and the National Register of Sprayer Operators CPD points. Uh, if you're registered to either of those bodies, please contact us at the Society directly after the event. And finally, please be aware that we're recording today's presentation as well. Well, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Jane Rickson. Professor Jane Rickson is a uh, soil scientist with over 30 years experience of research, consultancy and teaching in soil and water engineering, specialising in soil degradation processes and sustainable land management. Her work has focused on better understanding the soil functions and their role in the delivery of ecosystem goods and services, including water regulation, agricultural production and carbon storage. She uses multidisciplinary approaches to integrate fundamental and applied land resources science in a range of spatial and temporal scales. So thank you, Jane, and, and over to you. Good afternoon, Jane. Hello, good afternoon, hello. Hopefully this uh, will work. Um, can you see my screen okay? I can. Okay, very good. Let me just, uh, I can't see my screen. I need to minimise, as lovely as you are, Dan, I need, <laughs> I need to minimise you so that I can see my presentation so I know what I'm talking about. Um, of course, no no worries. So, A lot of people will appreciate the, the minimisation. Uh, yes, well, no, not at all. I don't want to be rude, but... Um, uh, I am struggling to just see my presentation now. Can anybody help me with that? If Sarah's waiting in the wings there. Um, sorry, everybody, apologies. Uh, a little bit of a technical hitch. Oh, here we go. Right. 
hopefully you can see my screen. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to BS Cube for inviting me to uh, give this presentation about something that is very close to my heart, something that I'm very passionate about. Um, so I've been titled my talk, um, Losing Ground, Should We Worry About Soil Erosion? Um, as Dan very kindly said, I've been working in soil erosion now for 30 years and no two days are the same. Uh, and I just love the, the, the subject, the, the, the issues around soil erosion, but uh, more optimistically, there's much that we can do about trying to control this uh, a critical soil degradation process. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think this is uh, really puts everything into context in terms of how important soil is. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but, uh, but also the impact of soil erosion. This is a wonderful quote. Um, the thin layer of soil covering the Earth's surface represents the difference between survival and extinction for most terrestrial life. And uh, it kind of doesn't get more important than that, I think. Um, I put a picture there of uh, uh, an apple to, to represent the sort of the planet that we live on um, and how precious that soil resource, which is really represented by the peel of that apple. And when you think that the land surface is only a quarter um, of the planet, uh, the rest is oceans and lakes and so on, you'll see how precious that soil resource is. And we need to um, uh, uh, keep it um, safe uh, and try and prevent uh, erosion degradation problems. Um, the uh, pictures that I've shown there are basically represent how thin soils can be in certain parts of the country and sort of rates of erosion, the damage that is done on site, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, um, but also then this amazing um, image that people see, um, I'm sure people will be aware of on the right hand side, showing where all of that soil is ending up and it's actually uh, ending up in, in rivers and streams and lakes and obviously out into the, the ocean as well. So um, before I sort of talk about um, some of the work that we're doing about soil erosion, trying to um, estimate rates of erosion and monitor soil erosion, you know, how bad a problem is it? Are soil scientists overstating the problem because it keeps them in jobs and keeps them busy? Um, let's just have a look at why we should be uh, in, interested in soil erosion in particular. I think if you look at some of the, the on-site effects of soil erosion, um, there's great discussion about the impact on food production. Um, obviously, if you're losing your soil resources, your depth of soil, you've got less um, water holding capacity, nutrients there available and rooting depth. So there is concern about um, biomass um, and yields associated with soil erosion. We did some very, very simple experiments, incredibly simple experiments, looking at soil depth and the effect it had on yield. And as you can see in the graph on the right hand side, there is, not surprisingly, um, a, a notable effect of soil depth. Um, and as that decreases, so you get reduction in yields. And that has implications for food security, food price, food production and so on. So there's a great interest on how erosion impacts on food production. But also if we're losing our soils, we have less ability to regulate things like water, water storage, obviously related to flooding risks, carbon cycling, very, very important. We know soil is a really important store of carbon. Um, and again, if we erode soil, if we lose that soil, then we're also losing that precious carbon um, in the sediments that are being eroded. And that has implications, obviously, for um, CO2 emissions, global warming, climate change, and so on. And there's a bit of a feedback loop there because obviously global warming is associated with more extreme weather events that can cause more erosion. Um, a lot of my soil biology colleagues are very concerned about erosion and its effect on, on biodiversity. You know, we're, we're destroying the habitats for micro and macro organisms. There's some research looking at the erosion of these habitats and the microorganisms within them during erosion events. And then beyond sort of science, I'm, I'm really interested in the cultural aspects of soil and soil science. And if we're eroding this precious resource, we're also um, exposing things like archaeology, we're affecting recreation possibilities, potential. And we are eroding, uh, causing degradation of our sort of green and pleasant land, which has implications for the aesthetics um, and our sort of value of landscape and so on. 
But those on-site effects are actually probably minor compared with the off-site effects of soil erosion. Um, that sediment ends up somewhere and it will end up in some watercourse, be it as I say, a lake, river or the ocean. And sedimentation in watercourses, you'll see a picture on the right here showing the sediment concentrations that you can get in watercourses as a result of erosion processes. Um, I thought it'd be helpful and, and apologies for um, erosion colleagues out there, but I, I, I'm going to go back to basics if you don't mind and just talk about some of the definitions of soil erosion for, for people new to the subject. Um, it's quite useful to have a definition. It's the removal of soil, rock, artificial fill or any slope forming materials by erosive agents, be it rainfall, runoff, wind, landslides and so on. And soil erosion is a, is a very relevant indicator of landscape instability, inferior land quality and poor land management. So uh, it sounds a bit doom and gloom, but as I mentioned, there are things that we can do. And I think John Chin, who follows my presentation, will talk about how good land management can control some of these erosion processes. If you look at the high level, uh, um, it is identified, soil erosion is identified as a major threat to soil resources in Europe in the EU thematic strategy on soil protection and in DEFRA's 25 year environment plan showing that politicians, policymakers are uh, interested in soil erosion and appreciate the impact it has. So even at policy level, soil erosion is moving up um, that agenda. Um, I thought I'd put in some pretty pictures. Um, erosion soil scientists love uh, pretty pictures and just sort of, again, very uh, GCSE level um, uh, describe some of the types of soil erosion to people that are not familiar. Uh, we have rain splash erosion, the, the impact of individual drops on the soil surface. We have interrail or sheet erosion, which is this sort of aerial extent of erosion um, that we can get. We have rills. Um, I don't know if John Quinton is on the call, but uh, this photograph is, uh, was taken by John Quinton just outside Silso um, rills um, on, on arable land. And then when we get some severe erosion processes, we get gully erosion. You can see this is our research officer who was trying to measure the cross-sectional area of this gully so we could calculate the volume of sediment that had been removed. And you'll see that she's not quite tall enough to actually measure that depth, her meter rule. We'd all do it with laser scanning and goodness knows what nowadays. This is a long time ago. But clearly she's not tall enough to actually measure the, the, the gully depth. Uh, I'm joking, but she's fine. Then uh, we also have other types of erosion, uh, wind erosion. This photograph I took on my holidays last week in Suffolk. This is on an onion field um, that was being harvested in that lovely sunny very windy weather and you can see the amount of soil that is being removed from that um, uh, cultivation um, um, exercise and just the wind picking up the soil. And then we have large scale landslides, mass movements. Um, I'm not going to talk much about those today. Uh, and I took this photograph on the bottom right hand corner um, from the, the, the weekend paper, uh, a, a large landslide um, down in Dorset on the coastline there. So lots of different types of erosion. And again, pretty pictures, uh, or not so pretty pictures, I should say, of soil erosion in the UK. Many people think erosion is not an issue in the UK, but anecdotally and in certain sites, if you have a combination of soil, weather, land use, slope and so on, then you can get pretty severe um, erosion uh, even within the UK. I thought it might be useful just to look at some processes of soil erosion, um, just to get some handle of, and, and these processes are universal, whether you're looking at erosion in Bedfordshire or in Bali or wherever, they, they, these processes are fairly universal. Um, it's, it's important to look at, one of the reasons it's important to know these processes is that they help to devise soil conservation measures, soil erosion control measures. So we have as the first process uh, in erosion, uh, the detachment by rainfall. I'm talking about erosion by water here um, specifically. And you'll see that that individual raindrop has energy that then can be used to detach individual particles and small aggregates by the rainfall, depending on the intensity of that rainfall. Uh, and the runoff, the surface runoff is also um, um, exercised in detaching runoff so that on a particular slope in increment, we can see the amount of detachment of particles and aggregates by rainfall and by runoff. 
Um, erosion involves then the transport. It's not just the detachment of particles, but it's then the transport of those particles. And you'll see on the other side of this diagram, you'll see that we have transport capacity of rainfall. So in these jets of, of uh, water, particles and aggregates will be carried um, in those jets. But to be honest with you, this is quite a small process. This isn't a very effective process. Uh, most transport of the eroded material is actually carried away um, by runoff. And so that runoff then will carry those detached particles. And we simply compare how much material is being detached and how much can be carried away in transport. And then whichever is the smaller of those two will be the actual erosion rate. So if I'm detaching lots of material, but it can only transport a little amount of that, then my actual erosion rate will be the transport capacity rate and vice versa. And once we create that sediment, then the whole process starts again because then that material once deposited becomes soil that is then um, susceptible to further erosion processes. So you can see it's a sort of circular um, uh, process. And again, I think this is important to understand then how we can devise soil erosion control measures should we be trying to control this detachment by rainfall or by runoff or trying to reduce the transport capacity of flow? Um, so having sort of looked at the theory of, of what's actually happening, how, how bad is the problem in the UK? You know, we get asked by DEFRA and other environment agency and other organisations, you know, well, how bad is the problem? Uh, and I just want to say, show some of the research that we do in actually trying to estimate these rates of erosion. Um, there's a very good paper by Pierre Benno at the moment that has compiled all the erosion surveys and the erosion collection, monitoring, measurements. Um, a lot of it has been done by people like Bob Evans, for example, John Boardman. Uh, and you can see there's, there's quite a lot of um, surveys uh, actually trying to measure erosion rates. Um, we've carried out some field work ourselves, carrying um, measuring runoff and sediment from uh, field plots. This is my colleague uh, Rob Simmons, um, and again we do a lot of field measurements and volumetric measurements of, of rills. Uh, we carry out a lot of um, uh, erosion experiments in our rainfall simulation lab, and we have wind tunnels as well at Cranfield, so we can look at some of these processes of erosion and some of the factors influence it. And a lot of this empirical data is then used to develop erosion models. Um, uh, yes, the USLE is still very popular, but the, we're trying to get more mechanistic models developed so that we can actually uh, evaluate different things like different land uses, for example, what effect changing land use will have on erosion rates. So modeling is very important, but it's really important that we've got good field data, uh, reliable field data in which to validate those models and indeed to build the models in the first place. Um, so if I was pushed to say what are the sort of rates, the typical rates of erosion uh, in England and Wales, again we've done some work in the past to try and collate all of the literature to look at some of these rates um, and you'll see that uh, erosion is measured usually in tons per hectare per year. Uh, and we have different rates, whether we've got wind erosion, tillage erosion, which is associated with cultivation, moving soil from um, site A to site B, uh, co-extraction with root. This, this is uh, onions again, and you can see the amount of soil that is actually being harvested uh, with that crop uh, in particular. Um, and then we have our erosion by water, and you can see this, this, these rills and gullies on these very erodible soils. Uh, and this helps us to compare the, the, the importance of these different um, processes. And I just want to bring your attention to, well, what does that actually mean? What does 15 tonnes per hectare per year mean? If you then compare that with the tolerable level of erosion that was uh, uh, assessed by Frank Bahay and, and colleagues, and that was uh, estimated to be about one to two tonnes per hectare per year. That's, if you like, the soil formation rate. There's a lot of debate around that. but uh, you can see that we're getting net losses where soil erosion rates are particularly high um, compared with what is perceived to be tolerable. Um, we've sort of furthered this, the, 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 this sort of research and we've actually looked at, OK, well, um, what are the impacts of this soil loss in different areas? And, and we've been able to use our national soil inventory data 
to look at the impact of soil erosion risk and soil erosion rates um, assessed in the field and then comparing that with um, soil depth, known soil depth again from the National Soil Survey. Um, and we've come up with maps like this, many, many other maps as well, where we've predicted future soil loss um, by erosion in terms of the impact that soil loss has had on soil depth. And you can see um, that we're uh, losing a lot of soil and that might not be an issue where we've got deep soils, but where we've got very shallow soils, then uh, we estimate that in very small areas, but in some areas, we may actually lose that soil resource, that top soil resource completely by 2050 at current rates of, of erosion. And then of course, if you think about the impacts of climate change, where we're expecting more frequent, more extreme and longer duration events, uh, that might, that loss of soil, that loss of soil resource may actually accelerate under the impacts of climate change. Uh, all of this is sort of very physical sciences uh, in terms of rates of erosion and impacts of those erosion, but what does it mean? How can we make this um, uh, meaningful, if you like, to politicians, policymakers, and so on? And this is some work where we actually try to evaluate the economic costs of soil erosion in England and Wales, and we've subsequently done it for Scotland as well. And you'll see uh, in the first column, we looked at different soil degradation threats, uh, including soil erosion, which I've highlighted here. And if you look at the impact of soil erosion on things like agricultural production, food production, the impact of erosion on flooding, on water quality, on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, many other things that we know are affected by erosion, but we just don't have the economic data for that. We, we estimate that um, this is, by the way, 2011 prices, so this is out of date by sort of 10 years or so. But back then we estimated the cost of soil erosion in England and Wales alone per annum every year is about £165 million pounds a year. Um, and uh, we've done that subsequently, as I say, for Scotland, where we came up with a figure of £50 million pounds per annum. And what does that actually mean? I think it, it, it implies that we really need to be spending more money on soil erosion control measures to try and um, avoid these costs of soil erosion. Um, not only are we losing that precious resource, but also it's costing the economy uh, a great deal of money every year. And that's likely to increase because again, of climate change, as I've mentioned. Um, I want to finish now with, uh, that's all very doom and gloom actually, not very um, optimistic, but um, I do want to finish with, with this more um, promising um, uh, message. And I think John will pick this up in the following talk, that there is something that we can do about it. Um, and there is a lot of research also on soil erosion control measures. Um, I've listed some of them here and some of the effectiveness of those different erosion control measures. And as I say, hopefully this will feed on to um, John's talk that we can control erosion um, and we don't have to incur the sorts of costs that I've mentioned. So I think that's my last slide. So um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I think John will be speaking next, but I'll be happy to take any questions uh, later on uh, in this webinar. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you very much, Jane. That was a really fascinating uh, presentation and, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, yes, we will be taking questions uh, for both speakers, in fact, at the end of the session. So if you could submit your questions, and some of you have, uh, by 12.50, 10 to 1, uh, that will allow us time to go through as many as we can. Well, our next speaker is John Chin, as, uh, as Jane alluded to. John is a partner of Cobri Farms. It's a 1500 hectare family farming business based in Herefordshire. Uh, and cropping includes a very diverse menu here, asparagus, potatoes, green and fine beans, peas, broccoli, blueberries, rhubarb, and a kind of combination of crops in a small vineyard and quite a lot to whet the lunch and appetite today. Well, John is president of the Cambridge University Potato Growers uh, Research Association and has recently stepped down as the chair of the Centre for Crop Health and Protect, uh, Protection. And he's one of the four agri-tech centres established by the UK government to improve the uptake of science and technology on farms. So without further ado, thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon and, uh, and uh, we look forward to your presentation.
Okay. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, John. Hello. I've lost. Right. Can you see my display? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Good. Right. So thank you to the British Society of Soil Science for inviting me to speak today. Um, as you've heard many times, I'm John Chin and I'm a partner in a family business with my wife and two of our sons farming 1500 hectares from our base at Ross on Wye in the Wye Valley. That made me slightly embarrassed when I saw Jane's first slide with an awful lot of soil going out to sea through the Bristol Channel. That's the size of the problem that we have because our home farm is an old meander valley of the River Wye, which runs southwest to northeast with steep slopes of erodible sandy soil. Made worse by the fact that our focus is on producing high value fruit and vegetable crops that do grow very well on our irrigated sandy soils. And this cropping leads to a seasonal labour requirement of 1,300 people for harvesting and packing. Our number one crop is asparagus, which is a perennial crop that typically lasts 10 years from planting, and which, as one of Jane's slides showed, is a serious risk for soil erosion. And so, indeed, in 2003, we started planting asparagus in rows across the slopes of our valley fields. But we weren't following the contours because of the requirements of machinery, such as crop sprayers. We planted an early variety called Gynelim on our south facing slopes. And we covered the rows with mini tunnels of pocket polythene to produce an early harvest. And we planted a late variety, Backlim, on our no north facing slopes to extend our harvest into July. And all went well and it seemed to be working for the first two years. But then in 2006, heavy rainfall events resulted in water breaking through the asparagus beds, causing gully erosion and dirty water runoff. The mud and dirty water inevitably ended up on the valley road to be followed, despite our efforts at cleaning up, by a visit from the Environment Agency and eventually a court case and a fine, fastidiously followed up by a damning report on Radio 4's costing the earth. However, this experience was the start of my road to Dam Dam Damascus moment, when a friendly but very persuasive girl from natural England, Sarah Olney, showed me the error of my ways. She even persuaded the Environment Agency to adopt a carrot rather than a stick approach, advising rather than just fining farmers. Sarah went on to introduce me to Dr. Rob Simmons from Cranfield University. And gradually, I like to think I changed from poacher to gamekeeper. With advice from Cranfield University, we started retrofitting geotextile line grass waterways to areas of our asparagus fields where we were experiencing gully erosion and dirty water runoff. This was a new experience to me, and I had to learn how to establish grass waterways. But we identified the areas in fields where we were seeing gully erosion, and then to a plan that was drawn up for us by Cranfield University, we profiled the new to be grass waterways in these gully areas. And then we drilled a tufty grassy mixture and then covered the strips with either a jute or a coir geotextile. And hey presto, within a few months, we had some lovely grass, tufty grass sward growing inside these profile grass waterways. And what absolutely amazed me was they didn't necessarily stop water running off the field, but what water did run off was crystal clear, carrying no suspended solids at all. We realized that we needed to do more. Good soil management 
is about more than just keeping the soil in the field. As Jane said, that is our on-site problem. And up to then, we had really been worrying about the off-site effect of soil erosion in polluting watercourses, mud on the road, and so on. So we now needed to stop all soil erosion and improve the soil structure. So in 2011, we sponsored Joe Niz at Cranfield University on a four-year, initially MSc, then PhD project to investigate treatments to minimize soil erosion and dirty water runoff in asparagus. And this started us working even closer with Cranfield. And they went on then to do a topographical survey of all the fields prone to erosion in our valley at Cobry Farms. And that really taught us as we were trying to establish crops. The red lines are the ridge lines, but most importantly, the blue lines are the drainage lines where our fields are very prone to gully erosion. And that's what we needed to react to. However, we realized that good soil management starts long before a crop is planted. And that led us to get Cranfield University team involved before we planted a field with asparagus. And that's something that we have stuck to since. So here are two examples of pre-planting field layout plans drawn up for us by Cranfield. So first they carry out a pre-planting topographical survey, which shows the recommended asparagus row direction, the purple lines, and then the grass waterways and grass buffer strips for, for instance, these two fields here. So we have a grass waterway and then we have grass buffer strips. These ensure that no water stands or puddles on the field because anywhere we see water standing, even literally for a few hours, within a year, the asparagus plants in that area will be dead. It just cannot tolerate wet roots. However, we want the water to run off the fields, but we want all the water runoff to be at a non-erosive velocity so that it stays nice and clear. Then, following a trip to Canada, where I was amazed to see they never cultivate their asparagus fields at all post-planting, we set up a trial with Cranfield using funding from ourselves and AHGB. We set up a replicated trial to compare and contrast asparagus growing under combinations of no-till, min-till, full traditional tillage, mulching with compost or straw, and then <coughs> um, combined cropping with rye or mustard. It was a, it's a fully replicated trial and we're measuring the harvested yield and the spear thickness, the harvested quality, the asparagus root growth by doing some very elaborate soil coring that thankfully Cranfield are doing with um, some information from Dan Droth in the United States. We're looking at water runoff, soil erosion, and the rate of uh, water infiltration into the soil. We're monitoring the fern growth stage for stem phyllium infection. And AHDB are sponsoring PhD students at Ferris Science to monitor the soil microbiome for variations in earthworm and springtail counts, as well as arbuscal mycorrhizal fungi, fusarium species, and phytophthora. Three years into the trial, we already have some fascinating results. Asparagus harvest from the plots combined with rye have a 20% yield reduction, but there's no yield reduction when the companion crop is mustard. Plots with PAS 100 compost applied each year have a 20% yield increase, but plots mulched with wheat straw yielded the same as control plots. We've noticed much better soil moisture retention and earthworm counts when mulched with straw. So is the increased yield from compost due to increased nutrition? or due to soil structure improvement and increased arbuscal mycorrhizal fungi activity. Further results and analysis are awaited. However, what we and others have seen 
is what a difference the advice from Cranfield is making. This tweet from an agronomist, not associated at all with us or with Cranfield, says it all. What a difference land management can make. Which photo taken of the A449 under asparagus production? Incredibly, the crystal clear water one. An exceptional example of what can be achieved by proper soil management. And so a final thought. My passion is for asparagus, but the work that we are doing must be relevant to other perennial crops and even to forage maize, which could be undersown with rye in August by broadcasting seed over the top of the crop with a high clearance tractor. The soil would then be protected over winter with a cover crop and the rye could be harvested in the spring for an anaerobic digester or for use as cattle feed. So, should any successor to the single farm payment be made conditional on all arable land having a green cover crop over winter? Thank you. Some thoughts. That's it. Thank you so much, John. Thank you very much for that uh, and a really fascinating uh, presentation as well and uh, some really interesting thoughts there that we can definitely come back to. Uh, well, now we turn to uh, the questions and I've been monitoring the questions that you've been sending in and uh, I'll be asking the questions uh, uh, for the panellists on, on your behalf uh, this afternoon. Remember, if you want to submit any further questions, if you can do that, do so by 10 to 1. Uh, so that's about 13 minutes time to get those questions in, uh, questions in um, and uh, we'll get through as many as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, we've got a couple of questions that were sent in uh, throughout the first couple of uh, the first half of it, so to speak, but I'm sure John will uh, will wish to, uh, to comment on this as well. Um, this one here, the oceans have deep layers of sediment, including organics such as oil, so is erosion now significant compared with what has happened in other geological eras? That's a, a difficult question to start us off this afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I'm afraid I, I, if I can take that, that, that question, um, I haven't studied the um, rates of soil erosion in geological time scales. So I, I, I'm not the person to answer that question. The only thing I would say is that um, it, it is a current problem, a challenge in places. And I think our efforts for me should be managing the, the issue that we face today. Uh, I know that's sort of passing the buck a little bit and not answering the question directly, but I, I don't have any evidence or, or carried out any studies to look at how bad the problem is now compared with um, previously in sort of geological timescales. But I do know that in places it is an issue. And as I say, our analysis has suggested that if you've got thin soils and high erosion rates, you, we may be losing our soil resource completely. And with all the functions and the ecosystems goods and services that we know soils deliver. And for me, the focus should therefore be managing the issue that we face today. Um, and apologies to all geologists and, and people that have a longer time frame uh, in mind than that. That's fair enough. John, would you, uh, would you care to, to respond to that? Or, uh... Uh, I'm afraid that's completely uh, beyond my pay grade, um, except to say that, you know, I am very aware, have become increasingly aware of the impact that, that uh, un insensitive farming is having on, on fish populations in, in the River Wye and, and, you know, the environment in which we live. And, and we, as farmers, you know, we need to become increasingly proud of what we do. And, and I'm really quite pleased to see that through the work of people like Jane, the bar is being raised and, and farmers are advising each other and we are all trying to work to a higher standard the whole time in relation to our soils. Mm. Well, perhaps for, that was a follow up question on that then is about because of the, the, the nature of the zoom into soil webinars from the BS cubes uh, is 
the fact that we bring both academic and, and practitioners together uh, to discuss key soil issues. So would you say, Jane, from your perspective, that uh, soil scientists are now working much more with, with farmers, with agronomists, with, with land managers, so to speak, uh, than they used to in your kind of uh, experience of soil science? I, I, in, in my experience, I think that that relationship has always been um, quite closely linked. I think soil scientists, uh, erosion scientists, have always been working with farmers to understand the factors affecting erosion. Again, I, I mentioned Bob Evans' work, um, you know, dating back to the sort of 80s, 90s, uh, even 70s, um, uh, where, where he was actually going out onto farmers' fields, talking to farmers, observing soil erosion and I still think that that most of the evidence based on erosion rates in England and Wales comes from those going out into the field actually measuring um, volumetric surveys of rills and gullies and, and looking at soil depth losses due to erosion so uh, and I and I think not only is it the the impact of the problem of soil erosion affects land managers farmers um, you know contractors and so on um, but also the solutions lie there as well. So, um, you know, uh, I remember Michael Stocking um, at UEA um, said that soil conservation schemes, soil erosion control, control schemes will only work if you have the farmers, the land managers on board. And so it, it really is a bottom up approach in terms of um, solving the problem of soil erosion rather than a top down approach. And I think with all the policy you know elms and um you know, john mentioned at the end of his talk about what the new um cross compliance arrangements under the new agriculture and environmental bills you know what are those going to look like it's really really important that farmers are incentivized to protect their soils and and protect them from soil degradation including soil erosion um, so I think that relationship is good. And, and as I say, I, I really welcome the fact that we can work with farmers all over the world and land managers all over the world to try and understand the problem, the issues and the pressures, the often economic pressures that farmers and land managers face, um, uh, but work with them to try and come up with sustainable solutions. And when I say sustainable, I mean economically viable as well as environmentally protective um, measures. Yeah, that's very interesting. John, from your perspective, do you sense a, a change in, in the nature of the relationship between soil scientists and, and practitioners? Uh, there's been a, a huge change, I think, over, over about the last 15 years or so. Um, and I think importantly, and I'd like to acknowledge a tremendous change in the approach taken by the Environment Agency in Natural England, where they are much more interested in, in advising farmers and working with farmers rather than just um, finding us and so on. I, I, I can tell you that 20 years ago, if I saw an environment agency van coming down the drive to my farm, I could feel the hairs go up on the back of my neck. It was, you know, <laughs> this was not a nice experience. It wasn't going to be a nice conversation. Whereas now we work really closely with them. We're monitoring the streams and the rivers together. Uh, and, and, and that is spreading out to, to other farmers that they're, they're picking up and copying. But also we're, we're finding a tremendous access now through initially people like the Environment Agency in Natural England, but they're introducing farmers directly to people like, like Cranfield. I, I've worked very closely with, with Rob, Ev Rob Simmons at, at Cranfield and, and with Jane. And you know, they're accessible now to farmers, and that then makes farmers proud to, of, of what they can do and how they can change and do things better. Brilliant. Well, we've, we've received so many questions in the last five minutes, and I'm just been uh, organising them into some themes here. Uh, perhaps we can talk kind of uh, about the soil and the erosion, the problem first, and then perhaps later on about some of the solutions. So here's a quick one. Perhaps um, perhaps this is a, a, a quick fire one for, for both of you. It, does the type of soil affect the soil erosion rate? And therefore, which groups of soil orders erode faster um, than, than others, regardless of elevation? Uh, very much so. So the, the, the soil susceptibility to erosion is called erodibility, is known as the erodibility of soils. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, very simply, um, you need to look at the particle size of um, the soil to see how susceptible it is to erosion. Clays, 
clay soils i'm being really really um, and I'm, I'm feeling embarrassed in front of soil scientists but but basically if we look at um clays silts and sands the clay soils tend not to be erodible susceptible to erosion tend not to be because um, they're very fine particles have very high rates of cohesion so um, you need quite a lot of energy to actually detach those particles and um, they're very easy to transport once they've been detached but the cohesion um, between those clay particles tends to be high so clay soils tend not to be very erodible sandy soils um, tend not to be erodible because the grain size of the individual sand particles is quite large so again requires quite a bit of energy to actually detach but as john has shown on his very sandy soils then uh, erosion still occurs but it's the silty soils the the soils that have the texture with lots of silts that um, are halfway between not halfway but they're between the clays the fine clays and the coarse grain sand Silt soils tend to be the most susceptible to erosion because they have neither the cohesion of clay nor do they have the large grain size of sand. So if we were just looking at soil textures, when you start looking at some silty soils, sandy loam soils, sandy silty soils, those are very susceptible. And the other thing I would say is that um, organic matter is really, really important as well. The ability for those soils to aggregate, the strength of those soil aggregates. Soils are not just individual particles, they're aggregated into um, soil aggregates. And the stability of those aggregates really determines their erodibility. And that is a function of things like organic matter, but also the soil biology. Have we got that fungi to actually develop those high, high feed that then will bind those soil aggregates together. And John, you mentioned you had sandy soils uh, at your site, so that must be uh, terrible for, for soil erosion. Yeah, rather, well, and, and they are sandy loam soils and they're deep sandy loam soils and they're on slopes, quite steep slopes in places, quite long slopes in places. And so if you put that sandy loam soil type with long steep slopes, we can potentially have a big problem. Um, and, and the one thing that we're learning fast is that over the years of continual vegetable cropping, uh, on our, our sandy soils, we've got an organic matter content of less than 2%. Um, and, and we're now working consciously and very hard at, at cover cropping, com companion cropping, use of composting, um, in order to try to build the organic matter. And, and we're definitely starting to see some significant improvement to our soil structure and, our, and therefore our water infiltration uh, through our soils. If the water can infiltrate, it doesn't run off. And, mm. and if we stop it running off, we don't get the problem. So in addition, we can use our grass waterways. We can use grass buffer strips. We use grass buffer strips a lot. We've discovered a fantastic machine called the Wonder Wheel which as soon as we planted potatoes on any sort of a slope we run through the between the rows with this sort of like a subsoiling tine that then pulls little dams up behind and it's absolutely unbelievable how much difference a simple operation like that can make to causing water to infiltrate instead of run off and erode yeah, you mentioned uh, reduced tillage and, and leaving some residues on, on the field there. And of course, uh, back to the what Jane was saying about organic matter, we had a question about uh, improving carbon within soils and could improving carbon more generally, perhaps recalcitrant carbon? I think that's the particular question here was improving that recalcitrant carbon in the soil, helping to stabilise it within the soil, would it also reduce some types of soil erosion? Uh, well, definitely, as I say, that the, the aggregate stability is key here and the ability to 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 increase the water stable um, aggregation is very important. And certainly carbon has a very important role. Um, and then I think, you know, this asks the debate in terms of what is the best way to store carbon to both both sequester carbon from the atmosphere, but also then to store it within soils, because we all know that soils are a huge store of carbon and, and can make a difference in terms of emissions and um, uh, and global warming and climate change and so on. So I think it's really important that we start looking at some of these land management techniques that will um, help sequester and store carbon. And this might ask some difficult questions in terms of 
land use change you know can we ask farmers to incorporate lay grasses for example within their rotation that would help um, sequester and, and store some of this carbon that's going to have an e economic impact we we can't ask farmers who are currently cropping every year to then uh, introduce lay grasses because of the economic impact of that in the short term and you know farming is is an economic business these are livelihoods that that farmers have got to continue um, and so I think there are some very important policy decisions that we have to make in terms of um, helping to sequester and store carbon. And that might mean some very difficult land use um, decisions that farmers are going to have to make and the economic impact of that on their businesses. Um, yeah, if I can add, I, I totally, totally agree with Jane, but we have got some fields now where we harvested only about a month ago and we, we immediately put a cover crop on those fields. And that cover crop is, has already got si significant green bulk to it. And, and by the time we get through to next spring, you know, we'll be plowing in a significant am a, a amount of green crop. And, and, and so we can improve the organic matter of our soils if we work at it. And, and it's, it's a win-win, isn't it? Because our soils will be much better for growing crops if we can increase the, the carbon content and they'll be sequestering carbon out of, out of the atmosphere which will be good for climate change so i'd really like to think that we could see government support to encourage farmers to move in that direction yes well we've got a question uh, in in a while just about about incentivization incentives for farmers um, and for land managers uh, for, for soil erosion mitigation. I just wanted to ask a specific question to Jane. This is a, a question that was sent in uh, specifically to Jane about some of the data in, in this slide. She was, uh, th This person was surprised to see that the cost of erosion to the UK in 2011 was £165 million. Pound. Uh, and the, the person says this seems rather low given the potential mm -hmm. catastrophic impacts uh, are economic valuations of ecosystem services such as soil erosion valid? Um, that's an extremely good question. And um, I think in that slide, there were probably as many question marks as there were actual numbers. Um, it is very, that, that process was very, very difficult to actually put a value um, to the ecosystem service goods and services that were impacted by erosion inevitably it's going to be an underestimate um, the, the the paper is published you can see the methodology that we used um, we thought it was a good stab at trying to get put an economic value i agree with that person that it probably is an underestimate and obviously it's now out of date because um, uh, it was done back in 2010-11 um, and inevitably there are costs that are intangible very very difficult to actually put an economic cost to that and there were lots of assumptions made in that 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 um, research project um, so yes i take on board i think the other danger is that you know if you overstate the problem you know if we if we had been very pessimistic and put all the costs uh, in a very negative way then then there is a danger with that as well but um, you know, we, we tried to do the best we could with the data available. Uh, there are lots of health warnings associated with that, that there are many intangibles that we couldn't put a cost on. Um, and probably locally, I mean, remember this was at the national scale, so is that the appropriate scale to look at things like soil erosion um, when the, the impacts are actually more local, uh, much bigger impacts locally? Um, and maybe that wasn't the right scale to actually look at the cost of soil erosion. And I'm sure, sure John would say that locally, um, his costs, if they were aggregated amongst all other farmers that suffer from erosion impacts, uh, probably would work out more than that. But it was, it was a good stab with the methodology that we used. There were health warnings associated with that, um, but at least it tried to quantify what the cost will be. And, do remember I mentioned that you know climate change is probably going to increase those rates. We made assumptions about rates of erosion. Those are probably much higher now because of these extreme weather events. So I, I hasten to add that, that data is probably out of date now um, and I suspect it would be much higher now.
Yeah, well, well, thanks for that, Jane, and uh, and and certainly more more cause for uh, for further investigation, I guess. Uh, here's a question for John, um, which is about regulation. Maybe this is the point at which we start to turn towards some of the solutions in our final five minutes here. Uh, so, to what extent does John think that regulation was instrumental in his Damascus moment? Without the visit from the EA, would he have carried on regardless? I think that it's the attitude that changed, and, and it was a wonderful girl who unfortunately went to her funeral recently, but Sarah Olney was working for Natural England, and it was the way that she could come and speak to a farmer and, and, and talk him round. Up to then, you know, we just had this very aggressive attitude from the Environment Agency, and, and you know, people don't respond well to aggression and, and, and gun put your head we all respond much better to the, to the, the approach taken by Sarah and, and then picked up and, and, and brought to us by Cranfield, where we're made to see the error of our ways and how we can do it better. Um, the Environment Agency weren't honestly telling us how to do it better. They were just telling us that we shouldn't grow crops on our farm. We should put it all down to permanent pasture. Well, that's fine, but you know, we're supporting the livelihoods of 1,300 people on this farm. Um, yeah. It's a much bigger picture, and 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 so I, I think that regulation needs to be there for those that don't respond to fair treatment. But I do think that all farmers deserve fair treatment initially. Yes, yeah, certainly, and and maybe this brings us to the uh, idea of of, of incentives and and thinking about the bigger picture um, more broadly, not just about farmers, but where the food or foodstuffs end up perhaps on people's plates, they have to go to the supermarket. We've got a question here. Uh, could the incentives be delivered via improved food prices at the supermarket? And if so, how can we quantify the value of the conservation practices to the consumer so that they'd be all willing to, to pay for it and to see it reflected in, in what they pay at the supermarket? So bringing the soil erosion debate to, very much to the consumer. I, I, yes, it's a lovely idea. It's a lovely idea, but I suspect our food chains are so long and there is such a disconnect between a lot, not everyone, but a lot of um, consumers um, are quite um, detached or certainly indirectly affected by or linked to the food production system. Um, I know that's not true actually in John's case because I know he sells his asparagus uh, much more directly than that but I think um, I also think people don't the general public dare I say this I mean I don't know whether soils are valued um, I think the BS cubed is doing a fantastic job to try and get the value of soils up the agenda talking to children to school schools and students to demonstrate the importance of soil but I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of convincing the public of all the good things that come out of soil. I think it's still seen as that brown, muddy stuff that you've got to wash out of your clothes and off your shoes, rather than the, the amazing um, medium by which we get so many goods and services. And until there's more value placed on soils, I think it's very difficult to make that connection between food prices and the importance of protecting um, uh, soil. Yeah, uh, just a few lines, John. Sorry. Sorry, the only thing I'd say is is that uh, I was quite amazed when um, only three weeks ago I was asked by MS whether I could do a little selfie um, video for them emphasizing the importance of soils to the crops we grow for them. Um, and I did that and sent it in, and I believe they put that around on Facebook a bit. Um, so I think that there is a, a beginning of an awareness of how important soil is um, and, and there's this link and I, I don't know whether Jane liked to pick up on it but the su suggested link that healthy soils produce healthy crops, healthy yeah. crops produce healthy human bodies and minds. Yeah um, but I think I think that's definitely a, a perhaps a theme for a, another Zoom into Soil webinar, Healthy Soils and Healthy Minds. Thank you so much. On behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, uh, I'd like to express our thanks to, to Jane and John for coming along to present today. Uh, thank you also for attending. You'll find a quick feedback survey 
when you leave the webinar this afternoon, which we hope that you take some time to complete. Uh, the recording of the seminar, the video, will be available on our Society YouTube channel as well. And our next webinar will take place on Wednesday, the 7th of October. That's the 7th of October at 12 noon, as usual. And that will be on the theme of zero tillage. So keep looking out on our social media feeds for further information. Um, sorry we've run over just by a minute there, but I, I hope you've enjoyed the webinar and I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you and goodbye.